Happy Friday, everybody. Here we are back for another coffee call. And on the other line, I've got my trusty co-host every week, Justin Fabian. What's going on, man? Uh, what isn't going on? That's a better question today. I know. it's uh, You're going through a lot right now. <laughs> yeah, it's... I don't know. It's been a a long and unfortunately rough holiday for me. So anyway, I'm, it's all over and everything's. I, I don't need to get into it, but well, maybe this uh, little coffee call here for the next half hour will take your mind off it for a little bit. Yeah, I need it. What are we diving into? Yeah, let's get into this. I I got a, a listener submitted question again this week, like every week. For the coffee call, and it is work slash scouting you should be doing right now for the next year. So right now, we are right around the first of the year. I think it's what December. I don't know what is it. December twenty seventh right now, and you know a lot of a lot of uh, you know hunting seasons for states are coming to an end. I know Michigan, you know, ends the first of January um, for a couple. Uh, zones it goes through the month of January here in Michigan but that's it's a small part of of Michigan but basically everything here ends around the first of January and uh, yep. a lot of other places to do too as well and so someone had submitted a question and like I said it was work slash scouting you should be doing right now for next year so yeah I say let's dive right into this I've got some bullet points that I, I want to hit too but I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of kick it to you and in uh see what yours are right away yeah this is a great topic for right now because like you said everything's coming to an end or you know is already over or is about to be in the next seven to ten days so just one of those times where you, you're not doing any harm by risking you know blowing deer out of an area you may not been to all season just because you didn't want to you know encroach on that you know, that sanctuary that you might have set up. So if the season's over, yep. you're, you got nothing to lose. Um, and then on the other side of the coin, it's like, like for us in Iowa, it's, this is our last chance. Like it's like a Hail Mary. If you want to push in, you might bust them out, but if they live on your farm, I mean, they're going to be back. You're not going to do any harm next year by hunting that spot right now, especially now. Cause like we've had some really unseasonably warm weather here the last the last two weeks and uh you know deer just aren't hitting those late season food sources uh, like you would expect and uh with no snow on the ground and warmer temperatures there's a lot more browse options in the woods right now you know there's they're not out there you know holding on to the last ounce of life they got you know when it's like 20 below zero so really mild winter lots of food out there and Maybe they're staying tired to those sanctuaries because they don't need to leave. So, um, I know you got some bullet points, but I mean, my initial reaction is if you still have time to hunt, you know, put the chips in the middle of the table and just go for it. Um, yep. But if you're scouting, you have nothing to lose by, by putting ground scent in there. I mean, you're not going to blow anything up. You're not going to do any harm for next year. Not right now. Right. Yep. You know, the first thing I ask myself is when is the ideal time for scouting for next year? And I have a couple answers to that as well. Yeah. And yeah, it's agree. either A, you know, the the day after your season closes or, you know, let's say, let's say it's mid-December and you know you're not going to be able to hunt anymore the rest of the year you're done hunting yep. or you might you're t you might be tagged out or anything I say it starts right then yeah um you know that's kind of where I start and like right now so right now it's December 27th like I said we do have a couple more days of season but on the main farm here my farm I'm not going to take any does off that farm like you and Casey and I had talked last week um or earlier this week anyway is I, you know, my ratio is pretty good right now. I don't want to take any does off there. And now that my target buck, Jim Abbott, is, he's gone. Um, I haven't had any shooters showing up on camera that I really want to pursue. I've got some up-and-comers that I'm really excited to see next year. But 
basically my farm is to the point now where I'm ready to get in. And it makes me happy because right now it's all fresh in my mind. You know, my my season as far as like deer sightings, where they're moving is still fresh in my mind. And there's no snow on the ground right now. And I can go in there and look for primary scrape areas and um, rub lines and stuff like that. But um, I guess the first question you got to ask yourself is when the when is the ideal time to start scouting? Right. And I think another part of that is, you know, being able to recognize the sign when you find it where it's applicable to when you're going to hunt it. Like, you know, and by that I mean, you know, just for example, like if you're shed hunting in March or April, you know, I wouldn't put a lot of faith in finding – a hundred and you know, a hundred and sixty inch match set in March. I mean, I wouldn't start hunting that spot in October. I mean, to me, right. that just says this is where this deer winters. You know, this is probably a bedding area, but why is he here? Like, or it could be on a food source, right? Or it could be on a food source or a bedding area close to food, like we talked about with Casey. Yes, yep. And it's like you just you just gotta kind of read this, read the sign and the situation and. You know, and by sign, I don't mean like the physical sign, scrape, rub, shed. I just mean like analyze the situation, like figure out what the deer sign is telling you, you know, and and think about why it's there, whether you're scouting in December or March or April or August for that matter. You know, I'd put more faith in finding, I'd put more faith in finding buck beds in August as far as the way I'm going to hunt versus how I find a shed in a, on a cut bean field, you know, in February. Right. So it's just. So that's a good point. Jim Abbott is a good example of this because Jim Abbott, he summered on a certain piece of property or on a certain, in a certain area. And he falled, if that makes sense. He, in the fall, he lived in a certain area. Right. And in the winter, he lived in a different area. It was honestly three different areas he lived in throughout the year. And, you know, that early on, it is, you know, in September and August, they're still in bachelor groups and they're on a pretty strict pattern to food. So they're not going to go, I, they're not going to stray far from food and water from their beds. Right. They're not going to, you know, it's hot out. They're not going to move a long way. But then come fall, they're working up to that magical time of the rut and then does start coming into estrus and then they start branching out a little bit more, you know, and then they start, they start getting on their feet a little more and, um, start traveling a little farther. And then after the estrus and everybody knows, you know, they've got to rebuild that, you know, rebuild that fat content and everything, you know, that they just lost during the rut. So then they're going to go back to a, more or less bedding to food pattern and they're not going to be bedding far from the food so they don't want to waste much energy they're trying to preserve more of it and get more of it back so he was a perfect example he was in three different areas the last two years that i figured he was you know living yeah and that's you know two things you said there that triggered some thoughts for me was one um and again this is just something that i've heard bill say numerous times you know, every season, you know, we start identifying the different seasonal ranges that that, that deer have, especially mature deer. Um, and as they get older, it seems like those ranges, you know, they, they still, they're still isolated based on summer, fall, and winter range, but they become smaller, you know, and more, more condensed, I yep. guess, more narrow, because as they get older... Yep you know, in the hierarchy of animals, they're going to pass their prime. There's going to be some young stud up and comer who's going to put a six-year-old buck in his place. So, I mean, that's just the way it works. And as that happens, you know, their ranges become smaller and smaller. And that's why sometimes when you can find those older deer during deer season, it's actually, I think it's actually easier to kill a more mature deer than it is to kill a four or five year old deer. And I'm, and by, yeah. by, by mature and by saying those numbers, 
associating those ages to mature. I'm using that in reference to, you know, a, a Midwestern deer like Iowa or Kansas or Illinois. I know your guys' definition of mature is different, so I don't mean to imply that anybody can kill a six-year-old deer because I know that that's not possible. Right. So basically what you're saying is, because we see it, or I see it as well, over in the Midwest states, not as much here in Michigan, because honestly, I've only had one four-and-a-half-year-old to hunt here and nothing older than that. Right. But like over, you know, when we're hunting with Chris and Casey and everything, like when you get a six, seven-year-old deer, for some odd reason, they show themselves a lot. I don't know what it is. I can tell you, though, this year, Jim Abbott, was very visible in daylight all season. Like, obviously, in the early season, August and September, he was very visible. A lot of bucks are. But then when I figured he was going to come into the fall, I figured he was going to do what he did last year. I didn't get a lot of pictures of him last year, but when I did, they were all dark. All dark. I mean, every one of them. And um, that's what I figured he was going to do this year. But I had personally three sightings of him this year. No, 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 I'm sorry. Take that back. I had four sightings with him this year um, in the field. And I know that three neighbors of mine had saw him three different times, um, different days than when I saw him. So he was very visible as a four-year-old. And as a three-year-old, he was very, very nocturnal. So... I don't know if it just kind of goes with, you know, if Kansas and Iowa and stuff like that, if, if, if like a six year old is more equivalent to like a four year old here, I don't know that, yeah, that's you know, what I was how they say. work It's like, it's more, I, I don't know. I think it's just relative to, to the age structure, like in your herd. So it's like if, if in yep. Michigan, if, if it's unheard of to see a five year old buck, like, you know, that's the extreme you know, if five years old is, is the, is the unicorn, you know, of, of the deer in Michigan, you know, that maybe that three-year-old age class is the equivalent of, you know, the four-year-olds in the Midwest. Right. Like you're saying. So I think, and, and I mean, I don't know what the age structure looks like in Michigan, but I mean, I I just know that it's, it's not what it is in the Midwest based on what, what you've told me and what I know about you know, deer in Michigan, but it just makes sense, really. Like, I don't know. Yeah, and it, it all it could all be the demeanor of that deer as well. Yeah, that's, you know, I could have another possible. deer come up next year, like like Balm Pop, that was a three and a half year old this year. He could be a four year old next year if he made it through. I don't know if he did, but he could be the exact opposite. He was. I saw him once this year. Um, I have more nocturnal pictures of him this year couple during the day but next year he could go all nocturnal yeah or you know what i mean it's i think it has a has a way of you know of how the deer act as well and i like i said i or like i've said before deer to me are a lot like humans you know you have different types of humans so well before we get too far off track and i don't think it was too (laughs) far that's some good information but the next thing i want to get to is you know where's the first place that you start you know, when you're going into scout this, you know, for the next year. And, and me, I like to start with, first of all, I like to start with putting my cameras out on food sources to get inventory, yeah. to see what is there. And the second thing is just to go into scout. I like to look in the places that I wouldn't be going to in the fall. So if that's like a bedding area or a transition zone that I just really don't want to go into, that's kind of where I like to start. What about you? Yeah, I think, I don't know. I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense, and that is a, a good place to start. Um, I think for me, I would continue to scout as if I was hunting. Like, I would put, I would continue to look for all that late season activity and that late season sign, you know, and just put that in the bank for the following late season. And then, yep. you know, transition my scouting into the spring and summer months knowing I'm going to use what information I get to target my pre-rut hunts, you know, that third and fourth week of October, you know, just those early season hunts. Um, yeah. But again, like putting cameras out is a good, 
good place to start too and just getting inventory so you know what survived you know what Mm -hmm. what's left for you on your farm or even on public land i mean i would guess you're going to get a lot of pictures of squirrels and cardinals on public land but uh you know it's just nice to know what's left and especially if you're in some kind of intense management plan you know doing tsis and hinge cuts and you know if you're if you're if you're managing a hundred or two or three or however many acres, you know that's that's invaluable. It's, I mean, you know what you killed, but you know there's three other factors that affect a population, and if you only killed one deer, you don't know what your neighbor killed, or how many got hit by a exactly. car, or how many died in August of EHD. You know, so yep, yeah, knowing, yeah. knowing what you have to work with, and then. I don't know, just putting all those pieces together, you know, late season scouting yeah. that applies to late season hunting and then move into those, those warmer summer, you know, those warmer month scouting tactics of looking for beds, you know, the, the natural browse, that early season browse. Is it a good acorn yep. year? Is it a good apple year? What's the water s- sources look like, you know? Yeah, that's that's a good point too. Where's the water at? Is there water? You know, right now we had a really wet fall, yeah. and there's water in places still right now that there usually isn't water, and it it might be good to take note of that. So the next time you do have a wet fall, um, you know, there might be a water source that was built by Mother Nature that the deer like to use. So, you know, store that back in your memory bank for fall time or late season the rut or something yep. where you could possibly put a stand on that and you have the same situation that's another good good point there for yeah. sure and I, I you just you just said something that i don't think is off topic so I'll, I'll talk here for a second about it is i think a lot of people undervalue a water source during the rut like everybody hunts those those funnels those pinch points or like they'll get on a doe bedding area you know, or, you know, you start kind of transitioning to the downwind side of a food source, knowing those mature bucks are going to scent check. But, I mean, those bucks don't hardly eat or sleep for 10 days straight. And yep. they got to drink. I mean, it's, I think, yep. I think a water source, especially if you can find an isolated water source during the rut, um, you know, those does are getting run pretty hard too. I mean, the bucks are running a lot harder, obviously, but. If you can find an isolated water source someplace like in the timber or even if you put an artificial water source in like on a food plot or something, knowing there's no other water around, I mean, you got a, you got a honey hole just because of that water. Yeah. And that's a good, good point there as well. Artificial. So there's a couple of ways of doing that. And, you know, we might want to touch on this just because we're talking about it, but I have a, I've done it a couple different ways, but on uh, my family farm, couple years ago i put in a 40 gallon um horse trough basically you know it's a black rubber hard rubber horse trough but i put it in the ground and um filled it up with water and i'm i think it's two i think i'm two years i think i've been two hunting seasons in it and i got a i've had a camera over for the last two years and the deer love it and there's no water around that area at all and it's only a 40 gallon and um the water or the rain will keep it filled as well it's kept mine filled anyway and the deer love it now another source and this is another thing i'm going to do um next year is i have a uh a water tub with a trough on it it's from banks outdoors yep um and it looks like a stump it looks like a you know a stump in the ground. It's a big stump with a trough that goes off each side, and um, it's kind of hard just because you've got to put it somewhere where you can get the water to. So I have a big 500 gallon drum that I fill up with water, and then I trailer it out there. So I've got to put it pretty close, but I got a pump and everything. Um, so next year, I'm gonna put that out. Uh, in an area I found just yesterday with no water in it. And it's just one of those things I want, I, I want to add a little more, um, little more, you know, something that they want 
and they know it is there. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just, so it might be just one of those things that might just get them to come there even more, you know? Yeah. I, I think you'd be surprised at how much more they will be there. Like it's – if you can get it into a spot where there's no other water for, you know, a quarter or half a mile – well, a quarter mile is not that far. Probably a half to a mile away, you know, if you can just – strategically put it like on a bedding area or close to a food source if you have all those factors and you can you can get water into it it's money yeah i'm definitely going to do that this year and and that's another thing that's another way you know um here in michigan with the cwd and everything i you know in our rule books as of right now, still, you can use water sources like that, artificial water sources. Okay. I, to my knowledge, I don't think they have outlawed that yet. Um, I, I probably should look back at that. But that is that is another way to get around, you know, not being able to put mineral out, not being able to put out feed to get inventory or anything like that, or feeders or be able to bait. Yep. Like, that's another source that I think a lot of people, like you said, overlook that they could use to do it. I mean, I went and bought that 40 gallon tub for like, I don't know. I want to say it was like 30 bucks or something like that. And, or a lot of guys take the little blue kitty pools and they've done that too. If you, if you can stand looking at a, a a kitty pool out there, then, but it works. (laughs) A lot of guys have it work, you know? Yeah. Yep. We actually, two years ago, I, I filmed a hunt for North American whitetail, uh, out in Wyoming. Um, with James Kroll and Gordon Whittington. And uh, <clears throat> that's how these guys hunt out there. Like, there is no water. They, I don't know what their annual rainfall is, but it's close to nothing. And yep. same thing. The guy had, like, a 1,000-gallon tank in the back of a pickup that he would just fill with a 3-inch hose and a valve on it, you know, and, and he put um, those stainless steel stock tanks out there, just a, a cow watering tank. Yep. And we hunted those water tanks like it was a food plot. and. It was incredible. I mean, the deer just come out of yeah. every nook and cranny. Yep, for sure. And they work. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Yeah, if we, you get them there and, and the deer get used to them, they're going to work. Yeah, it was it was awesome. Like, I've never seen anything like that. I mean, I've never hunted deer like that, I should say. And both Gordon and James, uh, Dr. Kroll, they both killed great deer, coincidentally, over the same over the same water source. Really? Yeah, it was really cool. Like we made a whole episode out of it for the show, and um, Gordon wrote a really, really good article on it. You know, because it's just one of those things that seems unconventional to us, but in places like that, you know, Wyoming, um, Eastern Colorado, even maybe not so much in Montana, just because all the whitetails are in the river bottoms. But um, right, I don't know, just those places that are typical like western game states you know there are there are whitetails out there and they're competing for the same resources a lot of those other big game animals are and if if a water source is what fills your tag then that's what it takes and it's i think it's just overlooked a lot yeah and and honestly if you're in a high pressured area or any area at that matter um get it out there early. Like I'm going to get it at my water source, at least get the, the, the tub and the trough out there in the woods, like, like soon here soon. I mean, we're in end of December. Uh, I want to get it out there and at least have the deer see it and be around it. Yeah. And, um, even though it's going to be winter and it's going to freeze up, I'm not going to have any water in it, but I want it out there. I want them to see it and, you know, and then, uh, come this spring, that baby's going to be filled right up and, yep. and, uh, and hopefully they're going to be using it. I'm sure um, they will. Yeah. But, but, I'm, uh, I'm interested to see, but like I said, I've got to check, check the book first too, because it might've been outlawed. And I, as of, you know, before the CWD stuff, it wasn't, and I haven't actually looked back into it. So yeah, that'd be a good first step. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, um, so yeah, scouting. What were you gonna say? <laughs> I don't. I was, I was gonna try to yeah, get back scouting. to scouting. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I had an instance yesterday. I went out in an area, like I was telling you, I went out in an area that I don't go into in the fall, and because I thought it was a bedding area, 
Um, I haven't done any hinge cutting or habitat improvement on this piece yet. Um, but I went in that area and I do still go in with, you know, knee high boots, rubber boots. Um, I do have a set of clothing, you know, hunting clothing that stays with my, um, scent free hunting clothes that I use to hunt with these clothes. I don't use to hunt with, but these clothes are for like scouting missions like this, um, where I can still go in and still be relatively scent free. So I went in yesterday and I, I wanted to see where these deer were bedding and the deer weren't actually not bedding in there. It's a big transition zone, which is, is okay because now I know I can move in on it. Um, I found a rub line that was really fresh and I found a primary scrape and this primary scrape was pretty big, not giant, but it was pretty big. Um, the overhanging branch was tore up. I mean, it looked like, it honestly looked kind of like a mineral pit in a way, like the, the ground was kind of dug out. Yeah. Um, it was, it was a pretty aggressive scrape, if that makes sense. I think it was uh, a community so scrape? So I know where... I really think it is. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's on a highway like this, this timber I was going through, it's not a very big piece of timber. Um, but it was going, the runway is going right down the middle of this thing. And it was literally I 75 or I 80, you know, it, yep. and this was like the I 80 truck stop. And, uh, that might be a good name for it actually. <laughs> so, but it's, it's right there. And I honestly, I've got a bow stand tree just off a little ways. And I found where I can put in a little bit of food. I could put a food plot in next year. Um, it's about probably eighth of an acre, but it's going to take a little bit and it's going to be a poor man's plot. You know, you know, Bill Winky even talks a lot about poor man's plots where you can oh, yeah. go in there and do it with all the hand tools and everything. I think that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try that out. But, um, I would have never known about this spot, obviously, if if I didn't, you know, go in there after season and and look at it. But I'm glad I did, and that's just one of the one of the instances that I had yesterday that it really was just kind of a light bulb moment. Like, what am I missing here? I'm just in my stand that I have, you know, on the edge of this timber. It's just off this movement, so I don't really know what I'm missing. But I'm anxious to get in there and figure it out. Yeah, I don't blame you. It sounds awesome. You could just go sit it too. I mean, like I said, just I really could. I could go do a hang and bang, you know, this weekend and just go see what the heck happens. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if there's as much sign there as you say there is, it's obviously getting used enough to to probably go in there and see a deer. Right. And honestly, what I might do is I might go ground and pound. Yeah. You know, with a with a bow. Yeah. And um just get up in a brush in the brush pile because I don't really want to go in there. And, um, the tree that I want to get in, it need, it's got a, needs a lot of trimming. Um, it'd be kind of hard to go in there and hang and bang and and trim all that. I, I think it would. I I think it'd just be easier to go in there on the ground, sit just a little off and and get the right wind where I want and just see what the heck happens. You know. Yeah. No, it's. I I know how that goes. That's that's what. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly how I killed this year, just going into scout, yep. and it was too good to to go back for a tree stand or to leave until the next day. So I just I just sat there. Right. Um, yeah, it, that's another overlooked. I feel like another overlooked uh, um, little tool in the bag that you could do, and I don't do it enough. Oh. You know what I mean? It's like, gosh, I want to get in there, and yeah, it's. You know, you just kind of overthink it because I grew up where my dad always taught me that, you know, we, we hang in, we hang in tree stands. You know, we don't, yeah. we never ground and pound. Yeah, that's how, you know what I mean? That's how so many people hunt. And like, I really believe that like, <clears throat> from an evolutionary standpoint, I think deer are starting to look up for danger. Like they, they have no other reason to do that outside of a human. Like there's nothing in nature right. that's going to kill them from above. I mean, maybe a bobcat, Nothing. but you know, that's, it's not natural for them to have to look up for danger, but so many people right. like strictly hunt out of a tree stand. I feel like, I mean, and it's, it's not a bad thing. It's just the way that everyone's been taught. And this, this is the norm for, for hunters. And yep. you don't see too many deer hunters that are solely ground hunters, but I mean, I killed my deer this year off the ground. Um, Sarah Bomar killed a huge deer off the ground this year. Um, 
And I mean, all, all your traditional guys, I think 90% of them hunt on the ground, like yep. Josh Bomar, obviously, but I mean. Well, look at uh, the white tail adrenaline guys, Jared Scheffler. Yeah, that's all they do. You know, those guys are all ground and pound on state land. Yep. You know, public land. Yep. And I mean, he killed a and, he killed a record deer two years ago in Kansas. Yep. On the ground. Yeah, that's something to not overlook. And and honestly, in and a way to, to possibly combat that as well as if it's like, you know, in my situation right now, it could be something where man, I can't get a stand somewhere close here. Maybe I come in now and start making a little brush blind. Yep. For next year, <clears throat> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, hey, I got a, this predominant wind. Or make a couple of them for different wins if you got good access points. Come in there now where you not afraid of the scent and the deer will get used to them all year, you know, and, and just make a little brush blind. Yeah. I mean, that's it, – it, it still can be that easy. <laughs> yeah, you don't, definitely. You don't need to – you don't always need to pack in the ground blind or the tree stand or – you know, make it harder on yourself. I mean, certain situations you have to have a tree stand, but yep. I mean, I've, I've sat in a cornfield before, you know, where <clears throat> you just go like three or four rows back and sit on your ice fishing bucket or something, you know, and I wear Carhartt clothes to blend in with the corn as opposed to camo. And yep. I don't know. It's just, you're, you're, you're hiding in plain sight. That's how I feel about it. Yep. Yeah, for sure. But well, I we're we're up in time now. Oh yeah, thirty two minutes or so. Man, I feel like we could keep talking. <laughs> I know. I, I think we touched on enough topics there that we could dive into on on the hour long sessions. For sure. You know. So in closing, you know, we we hit a couple points. When is the ideal time to scout? And I think we both agree that it's when you're done hunting. You know, if you're done on December 1st and you know you can't hunt the rest of the year, get in there and do it then yeah. if you want. Or if you want to wait, um, if you still got a target buck out there and you and you can't hunt and you don't want to pressure him much, then, yeah, I'd probably wait till January, right. you know, yeah. February, somewhere around there. Yeah, like I guess what it boils down to is, like, the right time to do it is when you have time to do it. Just keep in mind, like, how it applies, like, Late season scouting yep. is probably going to apply more to late season hunts. If you're scouting in the spring and summer, you know, you're probably looking to apply those signs to your early season hunt. Yeah, and I think you can take some things from like right now, like, you know, this rub line I found yeah, for sure. in the scrape area. I think that was rut even up to now. I mean, there's deer still hitting scrapes right now. They, I mean, and checking them out, maybe not hitting them like aggressively, but still checking them out and everything. So, um, you know, some sign you find right now is, is a good, you kind of got to look at the, look at it around you, take a step back and like, okay, I got a rub line right here. Does the rub line happen in December? No. Rub lines are going to end up happening, you know, end of October, um, middle of October, end of October, you know, stuff like that, possibly in the rut. Um, and then scraping. Scraping is going to happen, you know, it's a wide range it, where it could happen, you know. But is that going to really happen in December? Not really. But the December time, like you were talking, food sources, see where the big highways are going to food sources or water sources. Because yep. another thing, when we talked about water, even though it's not hot out right now, deer need water in the cold. Like they need it bad Yep. Um, to replenish everything. So... I think just take a step back and just kind of look at the sign that's in your face and just put that onto a bullet point of what season and where you can, you know, use it, basically. Yeah, exactly. And uh, before I do go, I do want to remind everybody, right now we do have a giveaway going on oh, that's right. with America's Best Bowstrings. Yep. So um, the deadline for this is January 2nd. Today is December 27th. This is going to come out tomorrow on the 28th. Um, January 2nd is the deadline to to get submitted. So what you have to do is go to the Fall Podcast Instagram page or the America's Best Bowstrings Instagram page. Follow one of the, or, you know, follow both those Instagram pages if you haven't yet. And there's an original post that we both put on each page. And all you got to do is like that post and comment 
by tagging three friends and you automatically get uh, put in for the drawing and we're going to select a select a um, a person at random and then we will announce that winner on the podcast of that week so it'll be it'll be next friday's podcast so it'll probably be next friday's coffee call so um don't forget to go over there and do that but in the end that's all i got man do you have anything else no um just to clarify do they have to like or comment on both pictures or one or the other one or the other sorry okay yep thank you for saying that one or the other if you want to go to the fall podcast do that um, if you want to do it at America's Best, do that. I do recommend going and following both pages just because there's a lot of cool yeah. content on both pages. Um, yep. But this is strictly just on Instagram as well. So we will do some okay. on Facebook, um, but this is just on Instagram right now. So And it's for a Platinum Series bowstring. So this is the top-of-the-line string for them, and, or their top-of-the-line, and it's customized any color that you want um, for any bow that you want. So, And you can do traditional bow, you can do crossbow or compound bow. So Sweet. All that. That's a, great, that's a great deal. Awesome giveaway from those guys. Yeah. Definitely. Good good company to be uh, involved with, too. they got a great, great product, and they're really cool guys. They're, they're great people. So, Awesome. All right, well. Well, cool, man. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut you loose, and I will talk to you soon. Okay. We'll talk to you.